All right, good evening. Um, welcome to Amber Books 40 Minutes of Competence, uh, Solar Geometry Style. All right, you're going to mount photovoltaic panels or solar panels that produce electricity flush to the south facing roof in Boston. And uh, the roof in Boston, um, or Boston itself as a country or as a city, is located at 42 degrees north latitude, 72 degrees west longitude. And the question is, what should be the angle of measure A? And this is actually, um, these series of questions are really easy to answer, but they're also really easy to mess up. And that's why I wanted to go over them today. All right, so our answer then is 42 degrees. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be the same angle as, uh, as the latitude. So here's our latitude, 42 degrees north. If, assuming this is facing south, that this way is south, our angle A is going to be 42 degrees. If it was in, um, if it was in Florida, it would be 28 degrees. If it was in Philly, it would be 38 degrees. Um, so it, it just kind of depends. The optimal angle for year-round uh, year-round collection of electricity or year-round collection of uh, hot water. If this was an active solar panel, that's the kind that produced hot water. Um, it's going to be based on. Is going to be based on the um, is going to be based on the uh, the latitude. Americans will always do the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives. Uh, this is a quote attributed to uh, Winston Churchill, and it's kind of our national motto in this case when it when it relates as it relates to uh, all kinds of things. But in 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 the, in the context of what we're talking about now. Um, we're talking about um, renewables generally. Um, it's pretty remarkable, actually. I mean, you know, in, in my little hamlet in the uh, mountains of Western Virginia, um, as recently as 10 years ago, nobody knew what they were doing. People were attaching photovoltaics to roofs with, uh, with wood. Um, you can't do that. The code doesn't allow it because if the wind comes and it has to be something a little more substantial. Um, people were uh, running photovoltaics without labeling the wires. Is there no sound? Can you hear me? Someone wrote there's no sound. I want to make sure I can be heard. Oh, good. All right. Um, so, yeah, so uh, people were running wires that weren't labeled. You can't, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and inspectors were approving it because the inspectors didn't know what to do either. Uh, people were using uh, photovoltaic panels that were imported from countries uh, that maybe don't have the same standards as us and they weren't UL certified. Uh, and so, um, you know, you might put, I don't know, $50,000 worth of panels up, but they're not UL certified. You have to eat the cost as a solar installer. And then a few things started to happen. Um, the, the stimulus plan, plan uh, package from the last recession, um, that a lot of that went to solar installations. They called them shovel-ready projects, and a lot of them were solar projects. And so there was a huge amount of money and kind of people at once doing it. So a lot more people got into the solar installation game. Uh, number two, um, community colleges started offering solar installer classes and, and courses and, and majors and, and degrees and certificates. That was a big deal. And number three, and most importantly, is the price just came down. So, if, I mean, it just keeps coming down. So maybe 10 years ago it was uh, $12 a watt installed. Now it's $2.91 a watt installed. And that just keeps happening. And so um, the power in your area might cost this much and solar might cost this much. No one's going solar. The power in your area costs this much and solar costs this much. No one's going solar. But it's a tipping point thing. Once the cost of solar is actually cheaper than the cost of not solar, um, then you're going to see a tipping point. And we're going to see that pretty soon. Right now, it's 1.8% of the US uh, electricity production is solar, which doesn't sound like a lot. But um, 10 years ago, I think the total renewables was 1%. And now the total renewables is about 17%. So, um, and Virginia, um, where I live just passed a, a, a law with some bite to it that actually has some penalties and it, it says that uh, all power generation has to be renewable or at least low carbon. 
uh, are no carbon, carbon free by 2050. Or maybe renewable, I'm not sure. I've actually, as, a, as an environmentalist, I've definitely come around to nuclear. Um, the risk of nuclear is a grounding error compared to the, the penalty from, from climate change or atmosphere cancer. Um, all right, so now we're gonna do this on your own. Uh, so take a screenshot or a phone photo, but um, because when I put you in breakout rooms, uh, you're not gonna be able to see this. But you're gonna mount photovoltaic panels, solar panels that produce electricity, flush to the south-facing roof in Boston, 42 degrees north latitude, same question pretty much. But now we're asking, what is the measure B? So this angle from the horizontal to the normal of the roof, what is that angle? If you have B, which is this angle, uh, from normal to the horizon, and you have A, which is an angle from the horizon to the roof, uh, the roof, um, and we were to take B and bring it down here, and we were to take A and bring it over here, we could have a straight line going all the way across, and we know that straight line is 180 degrees all the way around. And C, the kind of distance from here to here, winds up being 90 degrees, which means that A plus B is 90 degrees. So these are complementary angles. The angle of the roof from the horizon um, and the angle of the normal to the roof um, from the horizon, as you might imagine, are complementary. If you add them together, they're 90 degrees. Well, we know that A is 42 degrees because we learned it last time. So if A is 42 degrees um, and uh, B is 90, then going to be 90 minus 42 degrees, because 90, A plus B is 90, and that's going to be equal to 48 degrees. So that's what that angle is. All right, our next one, uh, and please don't be shy, if you're the person who needs um, more caffeine midday, you can do the talking. Our next question, you're going to mount, a photovolta mount photovoltaic panels. Um, and this time we're going to uh, mount them again in Boston, but this time you wish to optimize for summer performance. And we're asking for the angle of measure A. So for summer performance, uh, we're asking for the angle of measure A. All right, the first question you might have had is um, why would you ever want to optimize for summer? Why would you want to optimize for summer? Well. Perhaps this is a, like an off-the-grid summer vacation house and summer is the only time we wish to charge the batteries. Or perhaps Boston is cloudy in the winter, so optimizing for summer collection kind of makes more sense. Or maybe um, it's not unusual for electricity rates to fluctuate and maybe they're much higher in the summer when demand peaks. So we want to optimize for the summer for that reason. Um, so what we're talking about now is we're talking about a uh, and and, and uh, Tyler, if you could just confirm for me that you can hear me, um, we're talking about um, uh, we're talking about uh, something that's going to be flatter. It's going to be flatter. So if we want to optimize for summer, you know the sun is high in the summer, um, and you know the sun is kind of low in the winter. And so for optimizing for summer, we're going to assume that the sun is high. And so our answer is going to be we're going to take our 42 degrees, which we would need for the latitude, and we're going to flatten it by 15 degrees, and we wind up with 27 degrees. Um, so essentially, if we wanted to optimize by summer, we take the latitude and we subtract by 15 degrees. So for optimizing for year round, uh, for the, the spring and fall solstice, like around now, um, we want it, the latitude. And the same with uh, when we factor in summer and winter, so summer is high, winter is low, this angle is the latitude in degrees. If we're optimizing for winter, we're gonna do the latitude plus 15 degrees. So we're gonna make it steeper because the sun is lower in the sky. And, and of course, these are all south facing in the northern hemisphere. And if this is for summer when the sun is higher, we're gonna make the solar uh, photovoltaic panel flatter. We're gonna make it flatter. All right, uh, this is our next one. I think it's our last one until we get into a few other things. So here, you're, and again, you may want to take a screenshot just to refresh your memory, but you're going to mount photovoltaic panels or solar panels that produce electricity, and you're going to mount them flush to the south-facing roof in Boston, and uh, now you wish to optimize for winter performance, and I'm asking for the angle B. 
So I'm asking for the, um, the angle of the normal uh, perpendicular to the roof relative to the horizontal. I'm asking for that angle and I'm optimizing for winter performance. All right, so now it's just a combination of the two things we learned before, one or three things. One is that if you're optimizing for year-round performance, um, the angle A is gonna be the latitude. Uh, two, if we're optimizing for winter performance, we're gonna subtract, um, I'm sorry, we're gonna add 15 degrees to make it steeper to angle A. And, and lastly, um, if we're gonna figure out angle B, we know that 90 minus angle A is going to be 90, 90, is going to be is going to be B. So what we want to do is we say okay, um, it's 40 A is 42 degrees. That's our latitude plus 15 degrees. That's to optimize for winter, um, and uh, that's going to give us 57 degrees. So that's going to be pretty steep. It's going to be pretty steep, and then um, we want 90 minus 57 to figure out angle B because that, um, that 57 is, is based on angle A. And so 90 minus 57 uh, is equal to 33 degrees. Uh, so angle B is going to be 33 degrees. All right, so now for next week, uh, what you're going to do is, and again, take a screenshot or take a phone photo, or you can wait till I send the email out. And if you don't get an email, uh, you can get on our email list by, going to, by emailing firms at amber-book.com. And what you're going to do is you're going to detail this parapet for rain control, air control, thermal control, and vapor control, and assume it's a mixed climate, so something like St. Louis, or um, Little Rock, or uh, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, or... Washington DC, some place that has cold winters and hot summers, and we want to provide rain control, air control, thermal control, and vapor control for this particular parapet. That's your assignment for next week. All right, um, someone asked last time, say we're in a temperate climate, California coast, equal demand for cooling and heating, heating days, what's more effective, geothermal or a trom wall? This was a question from last time. and. To, to answer that, let's talk a little bit about what these three different spaces are. Um, this is a direct gain space, and the direct gain space is really any south-facing window, but for it to work properly, we also need to insulate it pretty well, we have to air, air seal it pretty well, and we have to have some kind of a thermal mass element for it to work well, because the thermal mass is going to prevent it from overheating. Otherwise, what happens is it's a cool day, maybe it's 40, 40 or 50 degrees outside, but it's very sunny. And you've certainly been in situations where you've gotten in your car on a cool sunny day and the car itself is too hot and you have to open the window. And so we don't want that to happen. We don't want, on a sunny day, we don't want it to get so hot in the space that the air conditioning has to kick on or you have to open the window. We would like to capture that heat and kind of even it out. Not, not, we don't want it to overheat when the sun's out and then be too cold a few minutes later when the sun goes behind a cloud. So we want to kind of even it out or temper it so that the temperature doesn't do this, we want to kind of you know, smooth it out. Um, and we'll do that with thermal mass because thermal mass takes a while to heat up. Um, likewise, if we kind of say, okay, we're gonna have an unconditioned space, which is a sun space, which is a type of indirect gain space. So now we're conditioning our space here. We're taking this idea of bringing the sun in, uh, but we're not so worried about losing heat because it's an unconditioned space. And so if it overheats, it overheats. If it gets too cold, it gets too cold. But we're really interested in, in if this space does overheat, we're interested in that heat kind of working its way inward through this uh, element of thermal mass, which acts as a, a, both a moderator and a, what's called a thermal lag to kind of delay it. So it's kind of, again, kind of smooths out the, the, the spikes from overheating. Um, but what we're most interested here is Trom wall. It was invented by Felix Trom. I've uh, seen it written, it was invented in 1966. I saw it written yesterday that it was invented in the late 50s. Um, but anyhow, in the late 50s or mid 60s or somewhere between them, uh, this uh, French guy, Trom, Felix Trom, invented this idea. And the idea is um, that we're going to have glass and we're going to have uh, some kind of thermal mass and we're going to heat up the, and we're going to paint that, that thermal mass black so it absorbs as much as possible. And we're going to heat up the thermal mass and that thermal mass will then um, 
bring the, bring the heat inward. And the reason you've seen a trauma a lot in your life, but never in person unless you happen to visit like, you know, a national park in Utah, um, the reason is because it's stupid, frankly. <laughs> it's never really caught on for a reason. And I mean, so the advantage of the trauma wall is more of the mass sees the, the sun, sees the glass, and that's good. But in general, you have all the heat loss at night through the glass without any of the benefit of the daylight and view that you would get in a direct gain space. So generally, we just don't see that many trauma walls because they're frankly not that effective. Now, are they not effective anywhere? No, I mean, if you have a cold, um, if you have a cold, a small building in a cold climate, uh, in a dry climate where it's very sunny, so we're talking about maybe like Montana, um, and especially if that building is not going to be using, um, um, you know, it doesn't have much heat or, or, you know, even then, even then you probably, for it to be really effective, you need to slide night insulation. So at night you have to slide insulation here so that when you heat it up during the day, you can kind of capture it and not lose everything you gain at night. So it's really only for skin low dominated buildings in cold, dry climates that are, um, um, that, that aren't going to be using a lot of, you know, heating or something. So it's not a great solution. Whereas a geothermal system, we install about 50,000 of those a year in the U.S. They're actually quite common. I, you know, they were invented in the 20s. Einstein was a big fan. They'll save you about, mm, it's hard to say for sure, but something on cooling, something on the order of 50% or 40% of your cooling load. And what they're doing essentially is they're taking an air conditioner um, that also can be a heater and they're running water underground to take advantage of the cool temperature underground in the summer and the warmer temperature underground in the winter to make the whole system more efficient. I'm not going to get into it here. It probably could justify its own, um, its own, uh, its own 40 minutes of confidence. But know that if you search, uh, if you go to Google and you type in Amber Book, I'm sorry, if you go to YouTube and you type in Amber Book um, and you, there's three videos called How Air Conditioning Works and if you watch those three it will be clear to you um, how air conditioning works and also it'll be clear to you how, it should be clear to you, how a, a geothermal or, um, or ground coupled uh, heat pump uh, system works. Hi Michael, I have a question tied back to the photovoltaic panel issue. Sure. Uh, that said, uh, if we have a photovoltaic mounted on the ground, not not just oriented to the uh, roof, uh, so that we can adjust the angle. Uh, in no hemisphere, I know we should uh, have the photovoltaic panel facing south. Mm -hmm. Does it matter to facing like southeast, southwest? Doesn't cost any. What's the uh, maximum? Yeah, so, so are you asking for something that's going to follow the sun all day? Or are you asking for something that can be, you said it's movable. So is it tiltable like once a season you can just go out there with some tools and spend 20 minutes and tilt them? Or is it movable like it's going to be tracking the sun? No, it's not movable. Oh, it's okay. I thought you said it's movable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So right now, it really makes the most sense if you have solar access. So that means no trees. Um, no, near, no, no taller building nearby that's going to put it in the shadow for a good portion of the day. And it can face, you know, plus or minus 30 degrees of south and still be pretty good. If you have clear angle towards the sun, um, it's getting cheap enough where it's starting to make sense to put it on the west facing, um, especially if you're in a sunny climate. But a lot of it, again, depends on three or four things. It depends on how, many tree, how much tree cover you have. Uh, so how, you know, what's your kind of solar window? How much of the sun, sky can your solar panel see? It's going to matter, um, uh, it's going to matter um, uh, uh, what your latitude is, of course. And a big part of it that's not talked about enough is it's going to matter how much electricity costs where you are. So almost certainly some of you guys, well, where are you located? Uh, New York, you would say, but New York. Uh, I'm just encounter a question about you know, it, I'm just wondering that facing south is uh, is what we should follow. But yeah, facing south is what you should follow. Yes. Um, but yes, it can be so true south is the best. True south is the best, but you can go a little okay. little direction one way or another. Um, but I was going to say one of the one of the biggest issues is actually 
uh, how expensive is electricity? So in New York, um, your electricity is a lot more, probably it's like close to three times what mine is down here. Uh, I moved here from the city, and so I have a sense of that. Um, and so um, down here, the, the benefit, the marginal benefit, the added benefit relative to what I would pay otherwise is much higher than it is down here. Plus, certain states give rebates. So I think New York is one, certainly Maryland does, North Carolina does, um, uh, I think California does. Uh, there are a bunch of states that, that will help you offset the cost of the installation of the photovoltaic system, which again will kind of incentivize it a bit more. Next question. Hi, I have a question uh, with it's um, the material for the exterior of the wall of the building are required to meet energy uh, codes for insulation, and it asks what is the better insulation, a two inch. Can you hear me well? I can. So it asked for okay. what's the what's the best insulation. I didn't hear the first part, but I heard I heard what insulation I heard the the second part. What's the best insulation? I didn't hear the first part. I couldn't understand it. Which material selection has the best insulation value? Okay. Values? Okay. And it gives four choices: uh, two inches of stone with a K value of thirty, one inch of stucco with a K value of nine point seven. Four inch of brick with a K value of 8.4, or eight inches of concrete with a K value of 10. And I don't understand the response okay. they're giving. Yeah, so the, um, the K value is the conductivity. So the conductivity yeah. is on a per, per inch thick um, situation. So the first thing you have to do, so you said two inches, let me, let me go through that again. Well, first of all, um, I want to confirm this is not a question you saw on the exam, this is something you saw on someone else's... Uh, no, uh, it's on a black spectrum. Perfect, perfect. Thing. Okay. All right. So two inches of... Well, the first one is... Uh, the K value of the first one is what? Two inches of stone is 30. Okay. And the second one, the K value one is... stone was 9.7. Okay, um, and it was two inches of something, and what, how many inches thick of the 9.7? Well, it's one inch is the second one, mm -hmm. the next one is four inches, mm -hmm. and the next one is eight inches. Okay, so we want to get this to a point where it has, where we can make an R value out of it. So K is, is, called, is, called, conducti is called conductivity. And so what we want to do is we want to change that to resistivity. So conductivity, the higher the number, the better conductor it is. So K is conductivity. The higher the number, the better. But it's on a per inch basis. So if you have something, if you have something like drywall, you know it's going to be about a half inch. Well, that's a bad example. If you have something like CMU, um, it's a composite. It's got air and it's got concrete. And if you double the thickness, it's not going to double the insulative value. But if you have something like concrete or mineral wool or um, any kind of insulation, um, uh, anything that's homogeneous all the way through, if you double the thickness, it's going to double the uh, amount of uh, it's going to double the amount of insulation. And honestly, we don't know how thick our concrete is going to be. You know, it wouldn't be worth it to make a table that has one inch thick concrete, two inch thick concrete, three inch thick concrete, and so forth. We just need to figure out what the what the resistivity is per inch. So to figure out the resistivity. It's, uh, it's um, 1 over K is the resistivity. So first, right now it's in a situation where the higher the number, the more, uh, the, the, the faster heat will move through it. We want to change it, take the inverse of that so that the higher the number, the better the insulator. So we can take the first one, 1 over 30, is going to be like, uh, well, let me, let's just do it properly. It's going to be like 0.3, but, or 0.03. Zero, yeah, so um, that has a resistivity equal to uh, 0 0.03, and if we take 1 over 9.7, it's going to be something, um, it's going to be something like 0 0.1, I think, let's see. Right, that's right. Is that right? And if we take 1 yeah. over 8.4, it's also going to be pretty close to 0 0.1. Um, right. 0.12. Yeah. And if we take 
1 over 10 is going to be equal to 0 0.1. Um, so, but now we have, that tells us how good it performs, how well it performs per inch. And we have to multiply each one of these by the thickness. So um, this one is going to have an R value equal to 8 times 0 0.1 is equal to 0 0.8. That's this one. Okay. This one is going to have an R value equal to 0 0.12. And remember, we got that just by taking the inverse of 8.4. And we're going to multiply that by the thickness because that, 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 that uh, resistivity is per inch thick. So we multiply that by 4 and we get 0 0.48. So we already see that the R value of the last one is better than the second to last one. Let's look at the next one. We have one inch at 0.1. That's a pretty easy one to figure out. One times 0.1 is gonna be 0 0.1, the R value. And then our first one is two times 0.03. We know that's gonna be low. Um, it's gonna be uh, 0 0.06. So the winner is going to be the last one. Is that the answer okay. that they got? Oh, that's, that's not it. They said that the four inch goes is the winner. The four inch for them is the winner? <laughs> yeah, that's why I was confused. Okay, that may be a typo on their part. That okay. May, that may be a Good. typo on their part. Uh, last time I asked for new sign off suggestions. Um, someone said good night and be safe. I thought that was pretty good. Someone said be safe, get licensed. I thought that was pretty good, but I don't like be safe because it seems very uh, covid -y and I feel like once COVID's over, that's not going to be too relevant. Um, it's going to just make me sound like a nagging person. So I'm going to do good night, get licensed. So this is my first sign off on what will hopefully be thousands of them. Uh, good night and get licensed. <laughs>